In this video, we will discuss the drugs used in peptic ulcer disease. Now, when we talk about the normal regulation of gastric acid secretion, the role of six types of cells needs to be clarified. These include the parietal cell, the mucosal epithelial cell, the enterochromaffin-like cells, the cells of the enteric nervous system, the G cells and the D cells. Now let us go straight away into the role of the parietal cell. So here's a parietal cell with the capillaries on the basolateral aspect and the lumen of the stomach on the luminal aspect. The parietal cell has got an enzyme which we call carbonic anhydrase. As you might imagine, Carbonic anhydrase is responsible for the formation of carbonic acid. The substrates needed for the formation of carbonic acid are found ubiquitously in all cells and they include carbon dioxide and water. Now, the carbonic acid is going to split up into H plus ions and bicarbonate ions. The bicarbonate ions get thrown into the capillaries via a transporter located on the basolateral aspect of the parietal cell. Now this particular transporter is an antiporter and it's going to pump ions in the opposite direction from the blood into the parietal cell. Now this ion happens to be the chloride ion. The chloride ion makes its way to the luminal aspect of the parietal cell and is then uh, thrown out of the parietal cell into the lumen of the stomach. Similarly, the H plus ions also get thrown into the lumen of the stomach via a transporter seen this time on the luminal aspect of the parietal cell. This transporter happens to be an antiporter as well and it pumps potassium ions in the opposite direction. This now is the H plus K plus ATPase pump also called the proton pump. So now we have got H plus and Cl minus in the lumen of the stomach which combine to give us hydrochloric acid which is responsible for the highly acidic pH in the stomach. Right. The parietal cell is under the influence of four receptors. These include the receptor for PGI2, the receptor for acetylcholine, namely the muscarinic M3 receptor, the receptor for histamine, namely the H2 receptor, and finally the gastrin receptor. Now among these, when PGI2 binds to its receptor, it results in a decrease in the secretion of hydrochloric acid by the parietal cell. On the other hand, when all other receptors, the M3, H2 and gastrin receptors, when all these receptors are stimulated, the parietal cell is stimulated to release more hydrochloric acid. Right, now we move on to the mucosal epithelial cell. The mucosal epithelial cell is responsible for the secretion of bicarbonate as well as mucus. The mucosal epithelial cell is under the influence of two receptors, a receptor for acetylcholine and a receptor for PGE2. Now, when these receptors are stimulated, it results in three events. Firstly, it causes increased production of bicarbonate by the mucosal epithelial cell. Secondly, it results in an increase in mucus production by the mucosal epithelial cell. And thirdly, it results in an increased mucosal blood flow. Right. Now the third cell that we need to know about is the enterochromaffin-like cell. Now this cell produces histamine which binds to H2 receptors present on the parietal cell and stimulates the parietal cell to release more hydrochloric acid. The enterochromaffin-like cell is under the influence of two receptors, the receptor for acetylcholine and a receptor for gastrin. 
When both these receptors are stimulated, it causes the enterochromaffin-like cell to release more histamine and ultimately causes an increase in hydrochloric acid secretion by the parietal cell. All right, now, the cells of the enteric nervous system, these cells secrete acetylcholine. This acetylcholine can now bind to acetylcholine receptors present in the mucosal epithelial cell, the parietal cell, and the enterochromaffin-like cell. Now, it is true that when acetylcholine binds to its receptor on the mucosal epithelial cell, it causes an increase in bicarbonate production, an increase in mucus production, and an increase in the mucosal blood flow. All these are beneficial effects and prevent ulcers from forming. However, the predominant effect of acetylcholine is to increase hydrochloric acid production. The cells of the enteric nervous system are under the influence of a receptor, the M1 receptor for acetylcholine. Now we come to the G cells. The G cells secrete gastrin and this gastrin will bind to gastrin receptors on the parietal cell and on the enterochromaffin-like cell and they will stimulate these cells and the ultimate effect is a further increase in hydrochloric acid production by the parietal cell. Finally, we come to the D cells. The D cells secrete somatostatin. Somatostatin binds to its receptors on the G cells and inhibits the G cells from secreting excess amounts of gastrin. Right. Now let us have a very brief discussion on the etiology of peptic ulcer. We will only talk about the two most important etiological factors in peptic ulcer disease pathogenesis and this includes an infective etiology with helicobacter pylori and overuse of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. With regards to helicobacter pylori, helicobacter pylori has got certain virulence factors which promotes a pro-inflammatory uh, situation in the stomach and the small intestine and this predisposes the patient to development of peptic ulcers. Helicobacter pylori also causes depletion of the D cells and when D cells get depleted it causes a reduction in somatostatin. In the absence of somatostatin there is nothing to inhibit the G cells from going on secreting excessive amounts of gastrin. The G cells therefore go basically crazy. Excess amounts of gastrin is produced and this patient becomes highly predisposed to the development of a peptic ulcer. Now regarding the role of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in peptic ulcer formation, we know that cell membranes contain phospholipids and as long as the cell membrane remains intact nothing happens. But let us suppose there is a situation in which the patient has got say a viral infection or a bacterial infection. These situations can cause the cell membranes to get damaged. The membrane phospholipids are now exposed to enzymes such as phospholipase A2. This results in the formation of arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid may be acted upon by cyclooxygenase enzyme or lipooxygenase enzyme. Cyclooxygenase acts upon arachidonic acid and converts it into various prostaglandins which are pro-inflammatory in nature. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs act by inhibiting cyclooxygenase enzyme. Unfortunately, when it does this, it also depletes prostaglandin I2 and prostaglandin E2. From our previous discussions, we know that when PGI2 binds to its receptors on the parietal cell, 
it decreases the hydrochloric acid production by the parietal cell. We also discussed that when PGE2 binds to its receptors on the mucosal epithelial cell, it causes an increase in the secretion of bicarbonate, mucus, and it also causes an increase in mucosal blood flow. With the depletion of both these prostaglandins, this patient is at greater risk of developing a peptic ulcer. We now come to the first group of drugs used in the treatment of peptic ulcers. They are the proton pump inhibitors. These are by far the most important drugs used in the treatment of peptic ulcer. We did have a rudimentary look at the proton pump. Now let us look at the structure of the proton pump in greater detail. Now this is a parietal cell and like any other cell it has got a cytoplasm and a nucleus. The nucleus contains DNA and this DNA has got genes. When certain specific genes are transcribed and translated we get a protein which is called the H plus K plus ATPase pump or the proton pump. Like any other protein, this is a polymer of amino acids. One of the amino acids happens to be cysteine. And these cysteine residues have got a sulfhydryl group. Now this is the structure of the proton pump that we shall be referring to. Right. Now when we administer a proton pump orally, this proton pump inhibitor is going to end up in the lumen of the stomach where the pH is highly acidic. Now in the presence of the acidic pH of the stomach, the sulfonyl group of the proton pump inhibitor gets converted to the active form namely the sulfinamide or sulfinic acid derivatives. Now the sulfinamide and sulfinic acid derivatives are capable of binding to the cysteine residues of proteins lining the stomach. Now it is extremely important for us to understand that the proton pump cannot be accessed from the lumen of the stomach and therefore since the sulfinamide ion and the sulfinic acid derivatives are now in the lumen of the stomach they bind to cysteine residues of proteins lining the stomach but they do not bind to the proton pump themselves and therefore this is useless. We need to make some sort of arrangement by which the proton pump inhibitor escapes activation in the acidic pH of the stomach. This arrangement can be made by giving the proton pump inhibitor an enteric coating. The enteric coating protects the proton pump inhibitor from the acidic pH of the stomach. The PPI then proceeds to the small intestine where the pH is highly alkaline. Now in the presence of an alkaline pH, the enteric coating is lost. It is worth noting at this point that proton pump inhibitors are weakly alkaline drugs. We now have a situation where we have an alkaline drug existing in a medium which is alkaline in nature. The proton pump inhibitor is now going to exist in the unionized state or the lipid soluble state. In this state, it can easily cross biological membranes and biological barriers and it will enter the systemic circulation. In other words, it gets absorbed. Now once the proton pump inhibitor enters the systemic circulation, the systemic circulation will carry it to all parts of the body including the basolateral aspect of the parietal cell. The proton pump inhibitor now enters the parietal cell 
from the basolateral aspect this is now a sort of back door entry now it is important to note that within the parietal cell the pH is acidic we now encounter a situation where we have an alkaline drug in an acidic medium the proton pump inhibitor is now going to exist in the ionized state or the lipid insoluble state and the proton pump inhibitor gets trapped within the parietal cell this results in a situation where the concentration of the PPI is much higher in the parietal cell than it is in the plasma because once it enters the parietal cell it remains there it can't escape this phenomenon is called ion trapping right so now the proton pump inhibitor and its sulfonyl group in the presence of the acidic medium of the parietal cell gets converted to the sulfinamide moiety and the sulfonic acid derivatives which bind to the sulfhydryl group of the cysteine residues of the proton pump and inhibit the proton pump permanently the binding of the sulfinamide ion and the sulfonic acid derivatives to the sulfhydryl group is a covalent bond this is a permanent bond and cannot be reversed now of course the inhibition of the parietal cell from secreting hydrochloric acid is not going to last forever there are genes in the DNA of the parietal cell and upon transcription and translation fresh proton pumps will be synthesized however this process takes at least 24 to 48 hours and this explains why in spite of a half-life of around one hour the duration of action of a proton pump inhibitor can go up to 48 hours so this explains why a proton pump inhibitor is sometimes called a hit and run drug so a hit and run is a situation where um, the driver of a car or a, or a motorcyclist hits a pedestrian on the road and then escapes from the scene runs away from the scene there is no trace of the perpetrator of the crime so this is similar to what a proton pump inhibitor does if we administer a proton pump inhibitor it inhibits the proton pump and the duration of action is around 48 hours but if we were to measure the plasma concentration of proton pump inhibitor after say two or three hours of administration of the drug there will be no trace of the proton pump inhibitor in the plasma so this is why we call proton pump inhibitors a hit and run drug right so these are some examples of proton pump inhibitors the prototype drug being omiprazole we will continue this discussion in the next video